Good morning. Welcome to the Delaware County Chamber of Commerce uh, for another series of our speaker series. Uh, we are thrilled to have you all with us this morning. My name is Trish McFarland and I'm the president of the Delaware County Chamber of Commerce. And before we get into the program, I just wanted to let you all know about a couple of our upcoming events. Uh, this afternoon at 12, we have a, another virtual event, our Women in Leadership C-Suite shares their perspectives on navigating to the next normal. Tomorrow morning in person, we will have six of our state house representatives uh, giving us an update on what's happening. We're really excited to have our house uh, minority house leader, uh, Joanna McClinton, who will be joining us. Uh, and then on J June 16th, we have our annual membership luncheon, which is in person at Springfield Country Club. On June 22nd, we have a virtual event with the Small Business Administration uh, talking about certification for businesses. And then on June 23rd, we have a state of the county event with our uh, county elected officials. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to our esteemed chair, Vince Gordon, who has really made this committee what it is and is uh, the brains behind this all. Vince, thank you so much for your leadership. Thanks, Trish. I, 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 brains behind the, uh, uh, she, gives, she gives me too much credit, uh, but, but thank you anyway. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining the Delco Chamber and the Chamber's Business and Economic Equity Committee's presentation, Business Assistance Guidance for Minority, Small, and Women-Owned Businesses in the Region. For today's discussion, small, diverse businesses are minority, women, veteran, disabled and LGBTQ owned businesses with annual revenues below $35 million. Before we introduce our guest today, I would like to share with the audience information about the Business and Economic Equity Committee. The committee is the newest standing uh, chamber committee officially formed in July of 2020. And our goals are as follows. First is to encourage and support the hiring of diverse uh, employee base among uh, businesses here in Delaware County. Second is to encourage and support the procurement of goods and services from small diverse businesses in the Delaware Valley region. And third, to encourage uh, Delco Chamber members to support organizations that champion business equity and inclusion. And this support could be in time, talent, or treasure. If any of these uh, goals uh, excite you, I encourage any chamber member or, or potential chamber member to reach out to me or Trish and join our committee. Now to our program. You know, getting your business off the ground can be an overwhelming process. There, there are so many unknowns and how do you know you're doing it all right? Uh, where do you go for financial support? Today's presenter, Calvin Tucker, is here to provide guidance and resources. Calvin Tucker is the managing partner and CEO of Eagle Capital Advisors, LLC, a financial management and economic development consulting firm. He serves as capital manager for the West Philadelphia Financial Services Institution, otherwise known as WPFSI. Uh, Mr. Tucker has written several articles and blogs on small businesses and education in the minority community which appeared in the WPFSI monthly newsletter, the Philadelphia Daily News, and the Mount Airy Patch online newspaper. Mr. Tucker is a former co-host of the WPFSI radio show, There's Money Out There, which airs on WURD 900 AM every third Saturday of the month. Uh, Mr. Tucker graduated from Lincoln University in 1975 with a BA in Business Administration and Finance. Mr. Tucker, has served as uh, an executive and senior officer uh, of several financial institutions, such as Advanced Bank, United Bank of Philadelphia, GMAC, Commercial Mortgage Corporation, where he originated and closed well over three quarters of a billion in loan transactions. He was a regional and national director of the Resolution Trust Corporation, where he managed, liquidated, and closed numerous banking institutions and receivership assets. In addition to Mr. Tucker's business experience, he has served on numerous boards, such as the Presbyterian Children's Village, the West Philadelphia Cultural Center, the Paul Robeson House, the, the African American Chamber of Commerce, Entrepreneur Works, Habitat for Humanity, White Dog Enterprises, uh, Philadelphia Board of Public Assistance, and the University of Pennsylvania Real Estate Society. He is a former member of the Vesper Club and past member of the Near Equity Fund of Women's Opportunity Resource Center. Uh, Calvin's done a lot, and we're so appreciative to have him here today. Calvin, the floor is yours. 
Well, Vince, thank you very much. And I want to thank you and Trish and, and Jessica for giving me this opportunity to speak to your audience today, to the Delaware Ca uh, County Chamber of Commerce, its uh, directors, uh, as well as its members. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's a delight to always speak to organizations that support small businesses uh, and diverse businesses. Uh, <clears throat> and I'm here obviously because uh, I guess one of the things is uh, I wrote a book recently uh, about uh, uh, a guide to business assistance, a resource guide for small businesses. Because as you know, small businesses, and, and that's why I said it's, it's so, so important that you guys have recognized, uh, you know, small diverse businesses through your business and economic equity committee. Uh, because as you know, uh, you know, small businesses are, are the backbones of our local economy. Uh, they create jobs within, uh, within their own community. Uh, and circulate revenue and income in those communities as well, which which grows so subsequently grows those communities. Uh, and it's very important that we have groups like the Delaware County Chamber of Commerce recognizing uh, the importance of growing, you know, of growing their township, their community, uh, their county, uh, and the nation at, at large. But today I want to talk a little bit about um, my book. Uh, a Guide to Business Assistance in the Delaware Valley, which is the second iteration of a book I produced back in the 80s for the city of Philadelphia, A Guide to Business Assistance uh, in, in, in Philadelphia. <clears throat> and that guide uh, listed out about 133 different uh, structural organizations that provide financing and technical assistance and training. Uh, and during that time, there was a lot of on the job training uh, assistance that businesses could avail themselves of. So, you know, the city wanted to make sure that small businesses were aware of those particular uh, avenues to, to grow their businesses. And it was during the time where about 6.6% of uh, the uh, working population in the city were labor. Uh, and it was prior to the urban renewal where Gallery One moving from an industrial city into more of a, a retail uh, consumer driven city where they wanted to put in retail outlets to draw more uh, residents back to the city at the time. So uh, they thought it was very important to provide uh, this kind of uh, resource guide and they asked me if I could put it together, which ultimately I did. Uh, some 40 years later, uh, I, I thought about what exists today for small businesses. And, and, and I saw a void uh, that the only resource guide that was available at the time, and it may be some that I didn't, wasn't aware of, but the SBA produced a quarterly guide or an annual guide, uh, but principally it's for lenders who provide services of the SBA, like their, their 7A loan, which are made to small businesses, or their 504 loans, which are made to businesses that acquire facilities of which they occupy 51% of, and they're willing to finance through intermediaries like banks or insurance companies or, or non-traditional lenders like CDF, CDFIs, Community Development Financial Institutions. Uh, so what I thought with this new book, um, I would create a guide uh, of non-traditional sources because many small businesses, as you uh, are aware, uh, you, know, you know, capital is always important and many times they're undercapitalized uh, and they take from one payable to meet obligations of another payable. So that may impair their credit to a certain extent. So non-traditional lenders kind of understand that, you know, CDFIs across this uh, Commonwealth of which there are about 33 and 18 business lenders, they understand that. So they, they, they work with uh, small businesses uh, and diverse businesses uh, to a greater extent than do traditional lenders like banks or insurance companies or finance companies. Uh, so I thought this guide, which basically covers about 85 different uh, uh, non-traditional lenders, 
you know, including CDFI lenders or small business lenders uh, and, and, and some municipalities and authorities that provide uh, financial, technical and training assistance to small businesses. Uh, so I thought it was important to do that. Um, and before I get into the book, uh, which you can find my book, A, A Guide to Business Assistance. Uh, it is published by uh, Amazon. Uh, you can find it on Amazon at $9.99. You can find it in two formats, in the Kindle format or in the paperback format. Uh, and it's, it's going to be very helpful and useful uh, useful uh, as, you, as you grow your particular business. But before you do that, uh, you need to know some fundamental truths about financing and how to find financing. So you could turn to any page in the book and find a source that could provide you with assistance, but you need to know what you need to provide to that source. And so uh, I say, as most consultants uh, and, and lenders will say, that you have to meet uh, certain credit criteria. And there are five basic uh, criteria that um, all lenders look at, right? And it's called the five C's of credit. And many in your audience probably are aware, especially if you've gotten a loan from any source, you, you're aware of those items. Um, and those items are usually determined by the information they request from you. And we'll talk about what information do they, do they ask you to provide. Uh, but those five C's are one, your capacity, two, character, three, collateral, four, conditions, and five, capital. And let's explore what each one of these mean. Your capacity. What is your legal capacity to ask a lender for financing? Uh, if you're a sole proprietor and you own 100% of your business, typically the application you complete gives them the authority uh, to uh, do a credit report and other things, but it also says that you are the sole owner and therefore you have the legal authority, assuming you are of age uh, as well. And again, on the application, it'll show that. Secondly, uh, they look at character. Uh, and to most lenders, uh, they don't know you per se, unless you know it is your bank and you know your banker, uh, he or she may be aware of who you are and your business uh, business model, your business itself. Uh, but typically uh, lenders may not know you. So the way they determine character or the initial way to determine character is through your credit uh, report. Uh, so you would give them authority to pull a credit report uh, and they will make some uh, uh, assumptions based on how you have used credit in the past, how you use it currently, and they'll make a projective assumption of how you will use it based on how you use it in the past, how you use it in the future. Uh, what I tell many of my clients is as you get your medical checkup annually or your physical checkup annually, you need to get a credit checkup as well. And you can do that free of charge. You can go to www.freecreditreport.gov and you'll get a free credit report and you're entitled to one uh, at least once a year. And that credit report, while it will not give you what your credit rating is, and ratings are usually between 350 and, and 850, but it'll tell you what your, your, your credit profile is, what your trade credits are. If you have you know, Bloomingdale's or Saks Fifth Avenue or Discover, or if you have bank credit cards, uh, it'll show you how you utilize those. It could be, you know, you paid as agreed within your, 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 your payment cycle, you pay as agreed. That's a good thing. Uh, if you pay 30 days or 60 days or 90 days, that's going to be reflected on your credit report, and that's going to reduce your credit rating. Uh, most traditional lenders uh, determine that uh, the best credit for them is anywhere between 660, some 650, but 660 and up. Uh, so you have great, from their standpoint, you have great character. Uh, even though you may have a few deans or so on the credit report, may have a 30-day late or 60-day late, but you can explain 
those issues, but you're current now. Um, most non-traditional lenders uh, looking at the same credit report will say, okay, you may be a 600 credit score uh, or you may be a 580 credit score because I'm willing to take a little more risk. You're still going to have to provide me with uh, you know, some reasons why you find yourself in your current condition. Again, I want to know your character, and I'm using the credit report uh, as a way to determine your character. Um, thirdly, they look at collateral. Uh, if you're asking for, for example, $100,000 uh, in a loan, and maybe that loan is to acquire uh, a building to, to house your, your, your business, um, most traditional lenders will consider that $100,000, but will only finance uh, a portion of that $100,000. Um, as it is a commercial transaction, they may only finance 75% uh, of that transaction, of which you uh, need to put up the remaining 25% in equity. Uh, and that equity can come from your own sources or uh, other partners or associates can put that equity in. You just have to evidence why, how that equity uh, was, was contributed uh, to this particular project. Uh, and they do that because, um, you know, lender, all lenders lend on the worst case scenario. They want to make sure that they get their money back. And how do I guarantee you that I get my money back even if your business may have fallen into a rough patch for six months or 12 months and you can't meet your debt service payments, uh, but they need to get paid back. And if they have to execute uh, their, uh, say, lien position because they gave you a first mortgage on that property, uh, how, how are you going to get paid back? So uh, what they believe is if they liquidate that asset, that property uh, in any market, they will get at least, you know, the 75% back because uh, you've already invested dollars in. You may not get necessarily the 100000 but you'll get back uh, money that they put in. And that could be for real estate property, that could be for a piece of equipment, because uh, they're going to take a lien on that equipment, that could be for a truck or, you know, an automobile to, uh, to deliver your products to. All of those things are considered uh, and collateral is required. Your equity portion is required uh, in, in the transaction. Fourthly, they look at conditions. Now, you have little to do with conditions other than the fact that you have provided them with information that they're going to draw some assumptions off of. You ought to provide them with your financial statement. So they're going to see what they call your debt service coverage. Most non-traditional lenders will look at, uh, will say that for your net operating income, right? So you got gross income, less your your expenses gets you down to your net operating income. Uh, and then they take uh, debt service as a percentage of that. And most uh, tr non-traditional lenders will say that uh, for every dollar in debt, you should have a dollar in income. So you meet their debt service coverage relation relationship. For traditional lenders like banks or insurance companies, they may say, well, we want 150% uh, of debt coverage, meaning that uh, for every dollar in for a dollar in debt, you should have a dollar fifty in income, and that fifty is a reserve so that if you fall into trouble during the course of the term of the loan, you have you know you have a contingency to meet uh, or a reserve to meet to to meet the to meet the obligations of, of paying back debt. Uh, also in that is, uh, you know, your repayment terms, depending on your debt, they may uh, say, okay, or the lender may say, rather than give you a seven year term, right, uh, or give you a five year term, I'm gonna give you a seven year term because that reduces your monthly cash outlay for debt by a certain percentage, which may get you within the debt service coverage ratio that they require. Uh, and thirdly, uh, your interest rate 
can be determined by you know, your credit. Uh, so if you have prime credit, again, banks are considered prime credit from 660 and above, you may get what is considered as prime rate, uh, the Wall Street Journal prime, let's say Wall Street Journal prime now is, or oh, the indice is now 3.5%. Uh, and banks usually add another, say, 2 or 3% to cover their spread. So your so interest rate environment today may be six and a half, right? Um, but if your credit is impaired, uh, but they think that otherwise you have a great business plan, a good business model, uh, and all of the other factors or mitigating factors are there, they may say, well, look, rather than give you six and a half, I'm going to charge you a premium and give you a seven and a quarter or seven and an eighth interest rate. Uh, so you're paying a premium because your, your credit is, is somewhat impaired and they, they have to assume a little more risk because they think uh, you know, the deal is worthwhile. So that's why I said you have little to do with that, uh, but it's gonna be based on the documentation that you provide. And the fifth C of the five Cs is capital. Uh, and we talked a little bit about that in terms of collateral. So capital is your equity injection into the project that you're trying to do. You're asking for 100,000 for working capital, but I'm not gonna give you 100,000 because I want you to have some sweat in the game, some equity in the game. So I wanna see non-traditional lenders, you know, like CDFIs uh, or, or municipalities or authorities of municipalities, they may say, well, look, we want you to have 10% sweat in the game. So we'll give you a $90,000 loan. You just got to evidence uh, you, you're putting in 10,000 of your own money or 10,000 of maybe equity from other sources. Uh, but it's money that that's going in on an equity basis, not going in on a debt basis, right? So those are the five things that lenders <clears throat> you, you look at in all cases uh, <clears throat> to make a determination whether you are credit worthy enough to, to get a, a loan. But the second part <clears throat> of what I tell every business, um, whether they're small, medium, diverse or not, or large, is that you need a business plan. <clears throat> um, and the business plan does not have to be you know, a 30 page plan that details every movement of the business and anticipate. Uh, excuse me for one second. Uh, for, it does not have to detail every aspect of, of, of your business. It could be on a napkin. It could be on a one page, uh, one page document, uh, but it ought to have some some fundamental uh, uh, answers to who you are and what you're trying to achieve as a business. Now that business plan could be uh, a marketing plan. It could be a business strategy. It could be a marketing strategy. It could be a sales plan, right? But importantly, uh, again, when I went, did the radio, when I co-host the radio program, there's money out there. What I used to advise all business is that you either plan to succeed or you plan to fail, right? And you don't get in business, you don't work hard and save money and go to investors or get a loan uh, in anticipation of failing. You get that because you wanna succeed. You wanna succeed for your family, your, your community, uh, you know, so that your children can live a better life than you had an opportunity to live uh, up to this point. So I would say that a plan is a necessity. And a plan is not a stagnant document, because uh, a lot of my clients, you know, uh, when I first, uh, you know, introduce myself and start talking to them, oh, yeah, we have a business plan has been sitting on the shelf for two years. And you know, we don't follow it, we don't read it, we don't uh, change it because, you know, environments change with the, the COVID-19 over the last 24, 18 to 24 months, right? That environment has changed significantly. So the way you do business coming out of COVID is different than you did business going into COVID, right? Uh, you know, and you should have changed. I've, I've had some business owners, uh, I had a restaurant tour right? Uh, 
you know, the meat prices went up, uh, you know, and so they incurred more things as they thought about it that, okay, how do I meet my market demand now, right? And so they have to think about it. And in, in a, uh, an entertainment company, uh, she was closed down during this period of time, but didn't know how to uh, reopen her business, uh, didn't know how to uh, bring on a new product line. Uh, so there was no revenue being generated during that period of time. So all of the equity that she had built up in the business, she lost it, right? So my point is you need a plan and that plan is a living document. So you're thinking about it, you're working through it, uh, you read it on a daily basis, whether you have a synopsis of it, uh, you know, so that, uh, man, social media is more important today than it was, you know, two years ago or three years ago. So you have to begin to, to integrate those kinds of things into to, to your plan as you move forward. Now, what does the plan consist of, right? Uh, it's going to consist of a, a few things. You know, there should be a summary of what your management structure is, a description of the products that you're offering, products or services, what your goals are, a summary of your finances and marketing strategy. Uh, secondly, you should have a business description. You know, what's your history? What's the ownership? What's your mission or vision statement? <clears throat> um, and mission and vision statement are, are two different animals. Uh, most small businesses don't start off with a mission statement. They don't declare the purpose of their organization. That, and that's what a mission statement is. Or a vision statement. Where do I go from here? What do I aspire my business to be in the future, right? Because, uh, I mean, many of us, we work day to day. But a vision statement says, uh, five years from now, who are we, right? Um, <clears throat> today... I'm an office supply uh, manufacturer or retailer, right? But with a paperless society five years from now, will I be producing uh, paper for copy machines, right? Or, or do I have to transform into something differently? So those are questions that we have to put on the table and project out, you know, five years and 10 years and two years from now, if we want to get to that next level. Now, if we want to just replace our salary from a job and something that we call uh, independence, then, then we can certainly do that. But if you want to create a legacy and create wealth, right, you have to begin to plan it out. Uh, and, and the other point I just want to make on that is the one thing I also consult with my clients is, um, <clears throat> You know, during the, like the Japanese and in Europe, uh, during the course of a day, you know, take some time out and think about your business. You know, think about, you know, your production of revenue, how you produce revenue, uh, who, who are you going to approach to, to produce more revenue, uh, and then what are your expenses, and, and how do I solve my expenses, am I on track? To, to do what I need to do and to just clear your head and think about your business because we get so wrapped up into you know, our daily activities that we forget to think ahead because that's part of uh, a business owner's responsibility is how do you develop your business? Not just how you, you create the widgets, but it's also how do you develop your business? Now, let's go back. The third thing in the business plan should be a clear definition of the products and services, you know, that, that you offer. Uh, and the fourth should be your marketing strategy, right? Uh, how are you going to get your products and service to the marketplace? You know, do you use social, so, so, social media, right? Or are you on Facebook and Instagram? Uh, do you have a website, uh, you know? Those are important things because that's where this market is moving to uh, online sales. I mean, I do have a client that generates more from his online sales than, than from brick and mortar sales, from people walking in. So we have to look at those things as part of our integrated strategy. Uh, fifth is uh, competitive analysis. Who are your competitors, right? 
uh, and what what are their strengths and what are their weaknesses? You know, how do I better my product ba based on my competitors? Because you you want to sell more than your competitors to be successful. And for those of you who have gone to business school or have had business plans prepared or have prepared business plans, uh, you want to do a SWOT analysis, right? You want to know what your strengths, your weaknesses, your opportunities, and your threats are, right? Uh, you know, you're the greatest widget maker uh, in your county, in your state. And so that's a strength, right? Uh, you know, you are attentive to details. That's a strength, right? Um, or your weakness is, uh, you know, you're not open, uh, you know, nine to five, you're only open at nine to one, right? So am I losing uh, opportunity by not opening? So that's a weakness in the business model, right? And what are the opportunities? What are the sales opportunities? What, is a, what are the production opportunities? You want to you wanna think about that, you have that kind of integrated. And what are the threats to your business model uh, to be successful? Right. And, and, and so when you put all of those together, you mean you understand what you need to do to be a successful business. Uh, the next step would be your operating uh, overview, right? What your staffing level is, whether you, you have a current staffing that meets your, your, your market demand or whether, you know, you have to build revenue or you got to build capital base in order to meet the market demand uh, going forward, right? What's your human resource plan? What's your physical operation itself, right? Uh, you got 1,200 square feet, uh, but in order to be more productive, right, uh, and produce more widgets, you need 2,400 square feet. So does that require you to rent a warehouse facility somewhere or to maybe do a, uh, a co-share with another entity to produce more widgets, uh, your production capacity? Uh, and you know, what, what are your quotas uh, and manufacturing details? So all of those things ought to be included. And that's, again, I know it's a lot of information, but it's information that's important to to be successful. And, and that's what we all are trying to achieve is uh, success and moving to the next level of success. And finally, that business plan ought to have your financial uh, plans included. So if you're an existing business, you know, you will have your financial statements uh, in usually about three to five years of financial statements you've been in, so if you've only if you've been in business five years or three years or whatever you'll have three years of financial statements which will include your operating statement your income and your expense statement you'll show a balance sheet how much you own owe and what your net worth is right over that period of time and it also that shows what your growth has been over that that period of time as well and, and this is really important, uh, your cash flow. You have a cash flow statement, a five-year five year projection, a three-year projection, or an annualized or monthly cash flow. And you definitely want to have a cash flow because, um, you know, every day you have to think about uh, revenue coming in, whether it's through uh, merchant services or credit cards uh, or, uh, or and, and expenses going out. Right. So, you know, every week or two weeks, whatever your pay cycle is to pay your employees, you know, you have to have the money in your account. If, if you're using ADT or use another bookkeeping services or payroll services, you have to have the money to upload uh, to those services so they can cut checks for your employees. Uh, you need to know what's available, what's in your account available. So your, let's say your monthly expenses are twenty five thousand dollars a month right? And you are one week away from meeting payroll and meeting your accounts payables, but you only have $10,000 in the bank. How are you going to meet that $15,000 in five days? Do you have revenue coming in? Uh, do you have, uh, you know, uh, uh, receivables that are coming in that you got to collect on or haven't come in that you should have collected on. So you're going to have to get somebody on the phone. You, you're going to have to either get on the phone yourself and collect those revenues, right? Or, you know, if you have a line of credit with uh, a bank, 
you know, that means that if by this day, if you haven't, then you're going to have to draw down money from your line of credit. Uh, so again, you know, this business plan helps you uh, better understand, manage your business on an ongoing basis. And management is key, right? Because, you know, I'm a plumber, a carpenter or consultant, uh, and I'm going about my craft, right, on a daily basis. I'm not concerned about managing, which I should be, right? Um, and management is where we lose a lot of production, is where we lose a lot of growth potential. So that's why I said you take some time and as a manager, as an owner, and you think about your business and you think about, you know, the challenges and opportunities, right? Uh, and that helps you kind of continually grow your business, uh, whether you are small, medium, uh, diverse business or the like, uh, this is important uh, for each of you. Now, <clears throat> so I've kind of laid out, you know, the five C's, the business plan, but now you're ready to, you have my guide open, a guide to business assistance in Delaware Valley. You turn to page 57, you see the Chester uh, Business Association or the Chester uh, Economic Development Authority, and they make loans from 30 to 30,000 to 300,000, right? And, you know, it's in your bailiwick, you need to you need to, you know, buy equipment. You need to, you know, lease another facility. But you need thirty thousand dollars or thirty-five thousand dollars to do that, right? Uh, your business plan is important, and you can provide that to your lender as well, the non-traditional lender, or to the Chester County Economic Development Group as well. But you also have to ensure that there are some other documents uh, that go along with that, right? And here are the documents. Uh, there's going to be an application. So Chester County will have an application that you need to complete, or your bank will have an application you need to complete, uh, or, you know, some other CDFI that you're going through that offer the, uh, the kind of financing that you need. They're going to have an application. So you're going to complete the application, right? Then they're going to ask you, well, what's your source and use of funds, right? Uh, your source, obviously, you're coming to me, Chester County Economic Development Authority. Uh, so I'm asking you for $100,000. But I know, based on your policy, you're only going to give me $90,000, right? Uh, and another source is going to be equity that I'm going to contribute or that I'm going to bring from some other equity source to put in. So $90,000 from Chester County, $10,000 from you know, Calvin Tucker, owner of X business. Uh, so that's going to be my $100,000. Now I have to balance that with my use of funds, right? What are you going to use that $100,000 for? So I'm going to use $100,000 to buy me a piece of equipment, right? To help in my manufacturing process. Or, you know, if I'm in the t-shirt business or, you know, what other whatever other business I'm in, I'm going to use it to buy, you know, equipment or inventory or materials or supplies. Uh, and that's going to cost me $100,000 to do. So I balance my source and use of fund balances out. 100,000 source, 100,000 use, right? So <clears throat> if you are... Uh, I mean, again, this applies to most businesses, but especially if you're in the early stage, if you're an emerging business, if you're less than two years of age, uh, I'm going to ask you for your personal financial statement, right, which is going to list out what you own, what you owe, and it'll give me what your, your net worth is. Uh, you own your house, you own your car, you have 50000 in furniture in your house, you got computers, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you, uh, you, know, you may own some marketable securities, you got a checking account, savings account, all of those things are assets, that's what you own. Then liabilities, you have a mortgage, you got a house that's worth a, a half a million dollars, but you got a quarter of a million dollar mortgage on it, right? So I got to put that in, in what I owe. Right. You have student loans, you have credit card, uh, monthly credit card debt. Right. So that's your that's the liability is what you owe. Right. And the difference between what you own and owe is what you're worth. Right. So when they look at that, they say, OK, fine. So he's or she's worth, 
you know, a half a million or a quarter of a million, or, you know, uh, you zero out, you balance out, you, you, you know, uh, you, you have no equity personally, right? But that's not to say that you can't get a loan. I mean, they're just looking at you as an individual. I'm also going to ask you for your business, if you're in business uh, for, you know, two years or greater, I'm going to ask you for your business financial statements. Now, if you're in business for, let's say, a year, I'll have interim statements, right? But let's just say if you're in business for two years or greater, I'm going to ask you for two years of business financial statements, income statement, uh, a balance sheet, uh, as well as uh, as well as well uh, your uh, cash flow statement, right? Because I want to see how you've been running your business over that period of time. Then I'll ask you for... Uh, a copy of your personal as well as your business tax returns. And usually traditional and non-traditional lenders, we want three years to see what your trend has been over that period of time. And also that matches, that's going to match uh, to some extent uh, what your financial statements are showing that you are generating a profit uh, and then you are evidencing that profit by reporting that to the federal government. Now, I could go into some stories as a former banker having to sit before a grand jury uh, on businesses that have given me tax returns, right? And I usually have them sign a transcript document that I can, if anything happens, I could send a transcript in or request a transcript from IRS. But in one case, uh, a great, uh, you, this person and his family was a, were developers and they developed a lot of property. We financed a lot of property for them. Uh, then they, when the recession hit, they ran into difficulty. Uh, and again, I'm accepting all of their financial statements and tax returns and my underwriters are doing all of the underwriting. But at the end of the day, when they fell into problems and started to get into delinquency and default, we had to request the official documents. And the official documents from the IRS showed something very different in the same years that they had provided me, uh, you know, showed something very differently. And so uh, my uh, testimony had to be that if we had known, we would, have, we would have made different decisions, right? So that's why we ask for tax returns and typically they're gonna ask you to sign a, uh, a, a document that uh, requests uh, a tra official transcript from the IRS to make sure that you know the, the tax returns you provided uh, equal the tax return the tax returns that you provided to the IRS. Then uh, that ten percent equity that I've asked you to put in for that for that hundred thousand dollar loan or the ten thousand, I want to know what that equity injection is. So you'll just have a note to say the equity injection is coming from cash flow from your business, or it's coming from a partner or a family member or whatever, but it's equity. So I don't have to include that into my debt calculation. Then I'm gonna say, who are you as a business owner, as a principal or partner or proprietor, right? So I asked for a copy of your resume so I can get a better, again, we're talking about character as well, so I can get a better feel for who you are as an individual. Then you'll give me the description of your business. Now, if it's, you, you have your business plan, all of that is laid out as well. Uh, but if you're buying, let's say, for example, if you're, you wanna lease a new facility, you know, go from 12,000 to 24, I mean, 1,200 to 2,400 square feet, you're going to lease a new uh, facility or second uh, location, you know, I'm going to ask you for a copy of the lease. If you're buying a facility, obviously a copy of the agreement to sell. Uh, I need a statement of the business terms of, you know, all your debt. Uh, and then uh, I want an uh, aging of, you know, your accounts receivables, because I want to determine that if you have, let's say you got $50,000 in accounts receivables, outstanding. So <clears throat> that aging means that how old are they? Are they 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, 120 days? 120 days, you know, typically lenders say you write that off because you're not going to collect on it. You can continue to collect on it, but you write that off. 90 days, you know, there's a probability of collecting on a 90 days, but if it's 90 days out, it's going to be very difficult. So I, that's what I'm saying, you know, how stale are these receivables? The same thing with payables, right? Uh, 
are you paying your bills on time, right? 30, if you, if you have, you know, more 60 day payables, 90 day payables, uh, then that's, that's something that we have to look at as well, or at least what the lenders look at as well. And then, uh, you know, so that is your business plan and what that looks like. Uh, but as part, part of what I cover in my book uh, is technical assistance. And what I've found throughout my years, and most uh, lenders have found throughout their years, banks don't typically deal with that, but non-traditional lenders do, is that most small businesses and entrepreneurs are not necessarily prepared to receive financing or training assistance uh, because of the documentation that we just went over, right? So uh, my role or the business advisor's role is to help you collect that data, you know, either through your subcontractors, through your CPA or through your accountant or through your bookkeeper or through your, your, uh, your marketing person or your operations person. Let's kind of collect those, let's put them together, right? So that uh, we can get you in for loan consideration or any other consideration that you're looking for. Um, well, banks will tell you that we're not in the business. You come to us ready for financing or you got to wait in line, right? Uh, CDFIs will help you massage and work through that to get you to, to, get you to financing. Uh, but you may need urgent financing. And that's why I said uh, on a ongoing basis, this is something that you as an owner or manager should uh, be thinking about on a daily basis, putting together these documents so you're not in a rush to put them together at the end. And then training, uh, you know, every business requires training uh, to grow, to develop in the best way they can. I mean, corporations send folks out for training all the time to train uh, on the social uh, platform to understand what it is and how do you, you know, monetize it, et cetera. Uh, you know, training on, uh, you know, if you're, you're a manufacturer, you're an industrialist, or you, you know, consultant, you need to train on what the new financial models are, what the new uh, production line process is, uh, so that you are always on the cutting edge, and you can grow and expand uh, as, as you, you, you need to do. Uh, and then finally, I just want to talk, and I know we, we only have a couple more minutes left and, and, and Vincent may want to get some questions in or have some questions for the audience, <clears throat> but I just want to talk a little bit about the book. As I indicated before, you know, this guide, this resource guide uh, is helpful. It connects all of the things that we talked about, right? And as I said, when you turn to Delaware County, because the book is, is kind of sectionalized in that it talks about, uh, you know, countywide, Philadelphia, Montgomery, D Delaware, Chester, Bucks County, uh, Lehigh County. It goes into the tri-state area, into uh, Wilmington, Delaware, and Delaware, uh, state of Delaware, or to New Jersey and Tr Trenton and Camden, right? And it's not exclusive because if you're in Delaware County, there may be a lender uh, in New Jersey, non-traditional lender in New Jersey that can lend funds to you as well, uh, or in Philadelphia or, or Montgomery or Chester, right, or in, in, in uh, the Lehigh Valley uh, that could provide financing to you as well. So uh, there are 85 different uh, organizations listed in, in this guide. Uh, <clears throat> it's uh, 105 pages. Uh, of, of good quality information that I think will be very valuable to you as a small business owner uh, or manager. Um, and it may be helpful to associates of yours as well. Uh, and, you know, again, as I said, you can, you can retrieve the book, you can buy the book at uh, amazon.com. You can list it, it's listed under, you know, a guide for business assistance in Delaware Valley or under Calvin R. Tucker as the author. Uh, either way, you can Google it, it'll pop up uh, for $9.99. You can have it instantly uh, uh, on your Kindle if you're a Kindle user, uh, or you can have it on the next day if you're an Amazon Prime uh, in paperback format as well. But I just want you to be prepared. As I said, my show or the show was, 
you know, on the radio uh, was there's money out there, uh, but are you prepared to receive it? And you have to be prepared to receive those dollars, right? Capital is the mother's milk of business and we need capital, we need cash, whether we are small, medium or large. And, uh, you know, large businesses generate capital differently than we, than small businesses because their revenue uh, process is, is, is much larger than ours. So they generate capital from that. You know, that's an internal method, but they also go to the debt market and they lend, they borrow money on the debt market from banks uh, as well, uh, or they go to the equity market. Uh, small businesses, uh, there is more limited uh, ways to get the capital, uh, but it's there. That's why you have, you know, agencies, federal agencies like the Small Business Administration, you have the Chester County Economic Development Authority, you have Chester County, you have, you know, media and others that provide uh, opportunities for small businesses to to grow and obtain capital to grow their businesses as well as provide technical assistance. Now, technical assistance is always an issue for a lot of businesses because, uh, you know, as they say, you don't know what you don't know until you need to know it. Uh, <clears throat> but, um, uh, you know, we always look to sources to help us uh, provide technical assistance to help defray the cost. Because for example, my, my hourly rate could be, let's say $75 an hour uh, to help you, but you cannot afford that. Now, if you are a micro lender, the SBA subsidize those rates as well uh, to a lot of its uh, micro lenders, uh, small business lenders. Uh, and CDFI organizations as well. So uh, I wanna thank you for your time today, uh, Vince. If you uh, have any questions or any of your members of your audience have any questions, do not hesitate to, to ask me. Uh, I, I know it looks like we have six minutes or so, but, but again, thank you very much to you and Trish and Jessica for hosting me today. And hopefully, you know, I have added some value to, to your community. Calvin, uh, thank you very much. And I think um, as a small business owner myself, um, I learned some things today. Um, you know, I think you, you, uh, your, the theme of preparedness, um, I think is so important. Uh, small business, especially small minority uh, businesses during this last year, I think uh, one thing that, um, that helped my organization, my company, uh, stay the course during that time period was when there were opportunities to obtain assistance, be it in the form of a loan or a grant, uh, information that was required by a lender or by the county, you know, my organization was able to provide that without, uh, without issue. And it was because I had learned um, a long time ago the importance of being prepared as a business owner. So uh, not anticipating COVID, but certainly um, I think it's extremely important that this 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 uh, this uh, this topic of preparedness. So thank you. Um, I do have a, a question, and you covered a lot of the. Uh, so I don't want to uh, ask you know bank versus CDFI. I think you did a great job explaining it. But you know, as a as an entrepreneur, as a as a business owner, you know, uh, or as someone who's been on in, in the on the the lending side, you know, what is, what's the one or two things you would tell an entrepreneur who's, who's just starting out? What, you know, you, you've seen all types of businesses, all types of individuals, but what is, what's the one or two thing, uh, two things that, um, what, what, what would um, you give in terms of advice or counsel? Well, so, I mean, you, you hit it uh, on the head and that's kind of what the theme of my discussion was about being prepared. Uh, you know, are you prepared to be in business, right? And what's your objective of going in business? I mean, you could be what they call a corporatepreneur. You know, you could be in corporate America and been downsized or right-sized or whatever the case is. Uh, and then you, you know, you, you, you leave the company and you got to think about what you need to do to be productive because, you know, jobs are competitive and you may not be able to get it depending on your age uh, level. Uh, but, but you have to have a plan for succession. Uh, and you got to know what it takes to be in business. Um, for example, if you need, uh, you know, need cash. And so let's say, you know, you have a banker, 
right? And you you got your money, you know, you got a, you, you know, you have an, a, a, say an escrow account with a bank or you have, you know, uh, say an operating account with the bank, you know, you need to begin to understand who your banker is and let your banker understand you because they're the ones, I mean, they're the first touch that you have uh, to kind of growing what you want to do as a new entrepreneur, as a thought leader wanting to move into business. Those are the people that you need to do. And you need to search out. If you don't have a banker, you need to search out, uh, uh, you know, lending sources, right? Because, you know, those are the folks that, that you're going to need. Unless you, I mean, in most small businesses, they start out what they call bootstrapping, Right. And so you leave your company because you, you know, you, you, you think you're the best pie maker, the best, uh, you can make the best pie in the world and you want to start a, uh, uh, you know, a pie ma- a baking business, right? Uh, and you have, you know, maybe $30,000 in a 401k, right? Uh, and you want to use that, you know, and so the first thing you do is, okay, you know, you're going to invest in yourself, right? And so you want to take, maybe you want to take some of those dollars out you know, forgiving the fact that you're going to have a, you know, early withdrawal and a penalty and all of that, but uh, is that something you want to do as an individual? But again, that's equity you're bringing to the table. Now, you, you know, if, if you if you want to grow that business, you can replace that particular those particular dollars. But but I think it's important to to be prepared to have a plan. You know, don't just jump out without knowing what your next steps are. Uh, working with your current banker or finding a banker that is interested in you and interested in your background uh, and is willing to invest in you. And just one quick story. I mean, you, you're talking about your business. When I, uh, when I <clears throat> was contemplating buying a, um, uh, a mail processing business, uh, and, and the only reason I was contemplating because of a friend of mine had it and she was in Chester, PA. And uh, and she asked me if I would be interested in helping her, you know, do a study and work through and all bed. And I said, fine. And, and so then she said, well, would you be interested in being a minority partner? I says, so let me look at it. My wife and I let, let me look at it. And I came back and said, uh, yeah, I'd be interested in being a majority partner. Uh, because when I did the analysis, uh, you know, the indication was that the problem started at the top. And that was, so I went to my banker and my banker said, you got a great background, great, great resume. You got, and I had put together a very comprehensive business plan. They liked the business plan. They said, we'll finance you, right? Assuming you're going to buy this business, right? Uh, When I presented it back to the individual, uh, she didn't like the fact that I had flipped from being a minority partner to a majority partner uh, and was only extending a six months contract to her uh, because uh, I wanted to kind of, you know, level, uh, you know, uh, up on, on, on her experience over that six months, right? Uh, but I would pay her out over, you know, kind of earn out period. Uh, but when I went back, so when we, she said no, and her board chairman says no, no deal, when they, whatever, and I went back to my banker, my banker said, Cal, we love you, we love your business plan, but we were going to do it with a de novo because you had 600000 in equipment, even though some of it was obsolete, you know, but if, you know, once you get experience under your belt, uh, we would be willing to look at it. So but I'm just think, I just think that it's important to build those relationships uh, as you seek to grow as an entrepreneur, uh, you know, in the early stages and continue to build relationships and to continue to learn and train and educate yourself uh, so that you can grow the business, uh, um, you know, from the de novo, from the startup to the emerging and to uh, hopefully to the mature business as well. Great. Well, Calvin, uh, I, I want to uh, thank you again. Uh, I really appreciate your willingness to share your experience, your time today with the chamber and the, the chamber community. I want to thank the Delco Chamber, Trish and her team, uh, the business and economic equity committee for their ongoing support. And I certainly want to again thank Calvin Tucker, our guest, uh, for for his ongoing commitment to diversity and diversity in the business community. Um, We're out of time, uh, but I really, uh, again, want to uh, thank all who were able to attend and appreciate uh, uh, the support. I'm Vince Gordon, uh, chair of the Business and Economic Equity Committee. 
and I wish uh, everyone to uh, be well. Take care. Thank you.